a mother, there was a sense of urgency when I was in a position of having to make a choice of where to send my children to school. They had been in a Montessori school and that was wonderful and I loved it, but I didn't see the opportunity for the long term. So I went to the school where our daughter was attending and found the very best teacher at that school and asked him, how soon should we move the boys? And he immediately replied, as soon as possible. So I asked why, and he said, well, once they've had a lot of freedom, they won't like sitting at a desk and being talked at for eight hours a day. Before I could even think, I blurted out, I don't blame them. And he looked down at the ground for the longest time, and I thought I'd offended him. He looked up, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I don't either. Jeff and I decided we wanted to create our own community of learners. We didn't know what that would look like, and we started to pull best practices from all over, not knowing what we were creating, but knowing that we were creating something that didn't exist before. There are really two modes of thought about how to improve education. There's the reform movement. We're going to take traditional education, public or private, and change it. And then there's the disruptive movement. We're going to actually create something entirely new from scratch. Curiousness is basically the thing that seems to trump on all counts. It will. It seems like if you just can be curious, instead of just staying where you are, you will explore a lot more and you will get a lot farther. My first hard math I ever tried was calculus. And I'm like, what's in this? And I got taught it and now I do math. Now math is a breeze for me because that's how it does. You have to, you have to be curious. Really the whole concept of students teaching themselves has been incremental. It's been a matter of trial and error. I know I was inspired when a number of years ago I met Sugata Mitra at the very early stage of his hole-in-the-wall experiments, where he was putting a computer terminal in some of the poorest slums and villages around the world and finding out that students could teach themselves, literally with no teacher, learn at a faster and better rate than the best private schools in the countries. So I was inspired by Sugata, and I kept that in the back of my mind, and as we began, as Laura and I began to experiment, uh, at Acton Academy, we saw that what he was learning and seeing in some of the poorest villages of the world was true here as well. The teachers don't even answer very many questions, and I think that gives us a little more freedom. Like, say, why did the schedule, well, why is there a new schedule? They say, well, that's a great question. Guides don't answer questions, though, so you have to try and figure it out. I believe a teacher means teaching you how to learn and what you learn. And a guide is like guardrails. In 45 minutes? Okay. That's a challenge. That's great. Yes. What do you think? Well, what's best for you in 45 minutes? Is it better for you if you spend that whole time focusing on one subject area? Or do you work better if you break it up? So then that's your decision. One, uh, 192, 182, 172, 162. One, six, two. We usually start the day off with either a project time, project time or PE or core skills. And core skills is basically our work time. It gives us time to work at our own pace and do math and reading and spelling. Dream math. Punks. Math. And it's math. <laughs> it's like you, it's like a, you go to this. Girl. You go like right here and then you go to core skills. No, it's like you're and a it's squid. and there's like and there's, there's one lessons. Class. It's different lessons. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's really challenging and yeah. <laughs> on Khan Academy, which is math, they have like 
algebra and geometry and trig, so we set goals for what we want to accomplish in that. And then we set writing goals because there's a journaling question every day. And then we set reading goals for how many books or pages a week. I read two hours a day, about, mostly. At public school, I actually almost didn't pass um, for reading, and now I'm scoring, like, 10th grade for reading, which is... And we don't even actually work on reading comprehension at school, so it's kind of crazy. So question for you. As an entrepreneur, what's the most difficult thing about starting an adventure? If you think about making this, it's not just writing a book, it's best selling. Is it, can I make it, can I sell it, or can I find the investors? Kizzy. Um, I think it's can I make it, because if you don't make it, you're taking a really big risk, and it's also a lot of money, so can you make it? Agree or disagree? I agree. I think it's can you make it, because if you never make it, you're not going to be able to sell it, you're not going to be able to pitch it to investors, so making it is the first step. Really? I'll agree. That's a great. Claire? I disagree. I think that it would be um, finding the investors, because if you cannot find the investors, then you don't have the funds to make it, and then you can't sell it. The guides uh, create a launch, lead the discussion, but they step out and let us go back and forth and discuss what it is. And the Socratic method is not just asking questions. It's asking questions that don't have a right answer. So it's not asking, what is 2 plus 2 equals 4? Because you cannot have a dis uh, discussion about that, but you can have a discussion about, what do you think about blank? In the old days, and, and even today in traditional schools, learn to know is what's important. You want to become an expert. You want to memorize facts. You want to be able to regurgitate something someone's told you. Now, in an age of Google, that doesn't seem to make any sense. All information is free today. So we're focusing more on learning to do, taking real-world challenges. We have to do something courageous. You may have to go sell something. You may have to pitch an apprenticeship. You may have to get up and give a speech in the shoes of Winston Churchill. You learn to do something, not write a three-part essay. I mean, our students can do that, too, but they can also write an email that will get them a job. They can write a stirring speech in a historical figure's shoes. And by learning to do getting up and doing something hard in front of people in a real-world exhibition, you learn to be, because it's the courage to do that that forms all the rest of character. At Acton, we also focus on learning to be, learning to do. So this is learning to do and learning to be. So I'm dying ponchos, scars, necklaces, blankets, ancient Japanese dyeing technique with indigo and you fold and bind the fabric and it's all natural dye. Everything here is homemade. So I have the granola is homemade, the lip balm is homemade, and the scrubs are homemade. I'm selling uh, monster t-shirts that I drew and screen printed. I took them to a business and this is Yamakati, a milk bond. Um, Galtalope and Darvus. These are chocolate chips with uh, uh, cherry and carrot, and these are spinach blueberry. The goal for today is to make more money than my startup costs. The goal for today is make a profit because I spent a lot. My goal for the profit, I want about $300 maybe. What are you going to do with that money? I'm probably going to save it. Mm -hmm. What we found out is if we challenge these students with caring first, if it's a matter of, of inspiring them, getting them excited, they'll learn at 10 times the normal rate. I think that adults do not give credit to children. I, don't, I think they don't think they're as smart and as tough as they really are. Children are tough, they're resilient, they want to work hard, they're so curious, and adults tend to want to rein them in. It's just amazing what they do and what they want, and what they really want to do. They want to do wonderful things. What do I want to be when I'm older? That one wasn't coming. I didn't expect that one coming. Well, I want to become a professional beach volleyball player. Artist, actress, and um, author. I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Um, artist and author, and, uh, well, a soccer player, too. 
I have a few injustices that I want to fix, like corrupt government and uh, animal abuse. I'm a dancer at Ballet Austin. A filmmaker. <laughs> and probably a cinematographer. I also am an artist. A scientist. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to be because I'm good at chemistry. I'm good at math. I'm really just waiting for something to come up or something that I really love uh, to do to be able to combine my gifts, passions, and injustices all together into one. Elise, my twin sister, came to act in fifth grade. She went back to public school because she thinks it's better there. But I think she made the right decision because her thinking style, I don't believe is in the acting method. She likes to listen and hear and be taught and be shown the way instead of making the way herself. Anyone really could be an acting student. It just depends on how much like motivation you have to work towards things. Some kids cannot stay at Acton because they grew up in the public school mentality of just we'll tell you spit it back on paper a month later and you'll be fine. So that's why some people have to leave. We've had two students choose to leave Acton Academy. I think it's a time in life when a certain child might need more direction, more instruction than Acton Academy gives. You have to be able to make your own choices and manage your own work to stay in the system. Most children love that, feel honored by that, feel empowered, love responsibility, rise to the occasion, and, and others it just takes a little longer to get to that point. 80% of our students in our short history, we've, we've figured it's 80 to 90% of our students will make it all the way through, and it's, it's very natural. Acton is one of thousands of experiments that are going on now with disruptors around the country. And there won't be one size model of like ours that fits everyone. There'll be thousands of models. Just like in the real world, there are thousands of different ways to do almost anything. But the concept and the belief that students can actually teach themselves and can learn on their own much better than inside a system, that's the idea that's revolutionary. I think everyone in the class knows that they have a lot of potential and they can really do things. I don't think they tell themselves that. I think they say, I can get better, I can do this even more than um, I could before. I just need practice, practice, practice. You can always learn from your mistakes. So if I mess up on something on math, I can make sure I don't do the same thing twice over. You have a growth mindset. You're motivated to grow. And, you're, and by the fixed mindset, you believe that making a mistake is, you know, makes you feel bad and you feel ashamed of yourself. And others believe that making mistakes is an opportunity to learn. Most people that act in our growth mindsets, I believe. Really, if you fail early, cheaply, and often, it's a great thing because then you learn and you can get back up and you won't give up the next time when you actually are failing in the real world. If at first you don't succeed, then you're in good harmony. There used to be a poster saying that and stuck to the refrigerator because that meant you be... Then it showed four pe important people today that failed and then succeeded. And then... Because then that means you're learning off of stuff. That means you're that means you're learning and having a good time if you're failing. That means you're truly challenging yourself, not staying in your comfort zone the whole whole darn time. <laughs>